Good morning and welcome back to NWR's virtual conference. Up next, we have PainCheck. Uh, that's an Australian-based company that develops pain assessment technologies. This includes its smartphone-based medical device using artificial intelligence to assess and score pain levels in real time and update medical records in the cloud. The app is clinically proven to improve pain assessment and pain management for people with moderate to severe dementia and aged care. PainCheck's digital tool is available to professional carers in residential aged care facilities and home care settings. Today from the company, we have Philip Daffis. He is the Managing Director and CEO. He's a highly accomplished global business leader and people manager with an international career spanning more than 25 years with leading blue chip health care corporates and novel tech startup companies. Philip has held several, several senior global business leadership positions in Europe, US and Australia. He's been instrumental in building businesses, growing market share and developing extensive high level customer relationships in each sector. Just a reminder for those that have joined, uh, if you did want to ask a question, which we highly encourage, please do so via the Q&A box down the bottom. Philip, I'll now hand it over to you to get started. Thanks very much. Thank you. And look to all the audience, thank you for your time this morning. Um, today I'll provide you with a summary of the September quarterly results, which were posted on the ASX recently. And as you'll see, the pain check digital technology has con continued to provide a platform to continue sales and implementation within, within aged care during these very difficult times. Um, just very simply, pain check is a novel and safe clinical tool for carers and their residents for the long term future. Quick, uh, in terms of executive summary, um, for those who don't know the product or not aware of the business, pain check is a software as a service business model. We assess pain for those people who cannot verbalize through the use of AI, artificial intelligence, and video analysis. Um, PainCheck is a medical device. It comes in the form of an app, and it's a fully digital delivery system, which has proven to be really valuable in, in today's day and age. The product has been currently validated. We have four peer-reviewed publications, regulatory clearance with CEMARC and TGA, uh, which we've been for two, two and a half years now, and we're currently doing FDA. Um, we have sales in mostly in Australia, but also we've established sales in the UK, New Zealand and Singapore to date. And we've now got license agreements in more than 800 aged care facilities and close to 70,000 aged care beds. We now also have the capital in place to expand uh, in 2021 into Canada, into Europe and in 2022 into the US and other markets once we get the FDA clearance. As you will see also through this talk, very importantly, we've, we've started now to move out of aged care only and moved into home care, hospitals, and even disability sectors. So, so PainCheck has proven to be a very broad product use in, in, in um, healthcare. But first I'll start with the problem, and the problem that we're addressing. And the problem is that pain assessment is difficult. It's profoundly difficult for two extreme groups. Those living with dementia and co with co cognitive impairment who have lost their ability to reliably self-report their pain severity levels. The second is for pre-verbal children who have not yet built those communication skills to verbally express their pain. With these people, pain is often underdetected or not detected, uh, which can lead to misdiagnosis and incorrect treatments that can impact the quality of care provided. In terms of the, the size of this problem, there are, for some of the children, there are 400 million pre-verbal children in the world at any one time. And there are 50 million people who live with dementia that's predicted to grow to 75 million by 2025. Our first product to market is the adult so-called dementia app. So I'm going to focus on that first and I'll come back to the kids product a little bit later. So for people living with dementia, there are, there are a range of existing pain assessment tools to, for those populations, including the admin pain scale, which is in the center of your of, of the screen here. The, 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 these, these are well-proven, well-validated tools, but the problem is that they are, they are manual and paper-based. They're not able to be used at the point of care where you should be assessing pain, and they're subject to user bias. Uh, therefore, they are rarely today used by carers or nurses, just and leaving them to work out their own methods to assess pain for these people. What we've done with PainCheck, which is on the right-hand side of the, of the screen, we have intelligently automated the multidimensional pain assessment process, and we've introduced artificial intelligence to automate the facial assessment part, which is the most complex part of the process. 
And we do that through the use of AI and camera technology and a three second facial assessment of the rest of the residents. The total result is a fully mobile medical device that brings pain assessment to the point of care, maintaining the proven clinical practice. We're not changing clinical practice, but we're significantly imp improving the whole clinical process. And that's one of the reasons why it's, it gets rapid take up. We're not changing the way people think about pain, we're helping them do it better. I'm also pleased to confirm that Dr. Jennifer Abbey, who developed the Abbey Pain Scale um, and a leading light in pain assessment, has joined our advisory board and is helping the transition from tools like the Abbey Pain Scale to pain check. So our sole mission is to give a voice to those people who cannot reliably mobilise their pain. We focus right now on pe people being cared for in aged care or home care or hospitals, where a carer needs to decide whether their patient or resident is able to reliably communicate. Reasons why they don't, they're not reliable is because of complex needs such as the, the, the impact of dementia or cognitive impairment, stoicism, wanting to avoid medication, but, but, but often just living with chronic pain for many years and they think that pain, that, that is actually normal. Well actually it's not normal, it doesn't need to be normal and now it can be treated better and therefore improving overall care. This is a summary of our September results. And if you can see that during September, we've continued to, to sell and roll out pain check within residential care facilities, even during the pandemic. And in fact, we haven't actually visited an aged care facility for six months now since the COVID um, lockdown started. Um, so I will, go to, I will go into these results in a bit more detail in a minute. But what I would say is that this continues to validate we've adapted our sales, delivery, and support methods to, to support these clients during the pandemic while fitting into the restrictions of aged care visitations during the COVID pandemic. So this time I'm going to talk, to, we've started to talk now not about just resident aged care, which is our focus market, but we're now moving into home care and hospitals. So I'll talk about all three markets through this, through this presentation, but mostly focus on the results so far in aged care. As you're probably aware, one of the key drivers we had in the last year was the government, federal government support, uh, where we received $5 million worth of funding to implement up to 100,000 dementia beds in Australia um, in aged care for pain check usage. We've been rolling out these contracts the past six months, um, and we've got to thousand, close to 50,000 actual dementia beds. Um, and the, with each of these contracts, what happens in the first year is it's, it's actually government funded, but the second and third years they roll on to standard pain check SAS agreements. So, so far today we've, we've received 3 million in funding um, for the first 50,000 beds. In fact, prepayment was made in June 2019 for the second 25 bed tranche. Um, and we've now got another 2 million available for us right through till June this year for the second or the, the, the last 50,000 beds, total 100,000 dementia beds. So it's going well, um, it's, we'd like it to go a little bit faster, but it's going well, and we are still targeting that 100,000 beds by June. This is a summary of the growth over the past period. So as you can see on the left, that in the one year period, we've grown our aged care clients fivefold, um, of which we've got to around 25% of the total aged care market. So already pain check is now probably the most common most frequently used or, or, or accessed pain check clinical tool um, within aged care. Um, and this also, this shift shows our ability not just to sign up small aged care facilities, but also large clients with multiple aged care facilities. Those 795 racks or 223 clients, um, they, they actually produce six, close to 67,000 beds as you can see on the chart on the left-hand side. We've grown our beds from 12,000 under contract to close to 67,000 under contract in about 12 months, and more than 40,000 are dementia beds based upon the government um, contract um, and, and, um, and usage. So, so as I said before, we're nearly halfway towards that 100,000 dementia bed target. Um, in terms of the impact in terms of revenue, look on the right-hand side, Post the government grants, those 67,000 beds will translate into a close to $2.8 million ARR, 
on the basis that every, every one of them transitions across to the standard painship agreements 12 months after the initial government funding. So, so, so those, so we get, if we get to 100,000 beds, that would equate to 160,000 contracted places, which would result close to 7 million AR. The other key metric we use to sort of look at progress is the, the usage of the app. Um, as you can see from the graph on the right, we've had more than 190,000 cumulative clinical pain assessments conducted on pain check. This confirms the clinic, positive clinical utility of the app. We've grown 55,000 assessments in the past three months. Um, and therefore, you know, strong, strong ongoing utility. What's the average use of a resident? There is no average usage, but it ranges quite broadly. But we, we've seen that a, a well-experienced and well-developed client will typically conduct up to 10 pain assessments in a month per dementia resident. That's, that works out to our standard pricing around a dollar per week. So very cost-effective and, and very sticky in that sense. The other thing to be aware of is that we, we um, we store every single pain assessment carried out anywhere in the world. Um, it's provided to, for our clients, for them to assess their own data for better care, but it also helps us, you know, producing the world's largest database to better understand pain management trends and drive towards new product development and new features. So it's a, it's a really good tool that we can actually store the data and then assess it in detail. The other thing that's become very clear to us during, during um, the last few months is that obviously during COVID, we recognize that both the residents and their carers are vulnerable people. Uh, we have successfully pivoted across to using our remote digital capability. So we now sell, we've been selling, installing and training all facilities during lockdown remotely. So this leverages our e-learning platforms and online workshops. The, the key, key other benefit for PainCheck is that we conduct a pain assessment within two to three minutes, so it's rapid. We can do it from a socially caring distance, eliminating all the need for paperwork, thus again reducing risk to carers and their residents. This digital capability, you know, has, has really come strong the last six months, and it's a great tool that we can use as we, as we leverage our capability globally. Um, and, and, and developing a very effective and, and low cost business model. Just to give you some, some metrics on this. So yes, we've got over 800 facilities now and we've got access to pain check. If you look what we've done, we've got more than 2000 staff trained. Um, we've conducted more than 300 online workshops and more than 600 staff in Australia have completed our e-learning platform learners. The result of all that is that we now have more than 5,000 people registered to use PainCheck. That's part, part of who are trained the trainer program. And today we have more than 2,700 active carers using PainCheck um, in, aged, in aged care. The other successful thing we've done in the past is we've got a number of integration partners. And what that means is when, when we integrate with a care management system in, in aged care, what it means is that a pain check assessment is automatically transmitted to the care management system, which, which stores all the resident documentation and data and medication and allows them to have online and real-time pain management data and therefore improve the way they manage care. We've got, we've got, those are partners you can see there, most of those in Australia, but overseas as well. So we've got 800, over 8, 180,000 um, aged care beds where we, where we can fully integrate with these, with these uh, partners of ours. 50,000 beds in the UK, 7,000 beds in New Zealand, and we've now, with Alaya Care, got 500 um, home care clients or access to um, on an integrated basis. What this really means is that we can provide extra value as and when they take up. Pain check license. Uh, here's a summary of some of our clients. Uh, key, the key message here is that they're a mix of large, medium, and small clients, and they're all across both private and public um, and every state in Australia. Great having support from the federal government, great having support from Dementia Support Australia, and also the CEO of Pain Australia, who recently wrote a, an article with us. So we've got all the all the key supporters we need to, to actually drive and improve our business model. 
So in summary, you know, this is where we stand right now in aged care. Um, and the point about this chart is that Australia is a great opening market for us. It's a supermarket to start with, but our real focus is international. So we're in Australia, we've got good penetration there. We've started in the UK, we have a company in the UK, and that's a larger market. We've got a partner now also in, in Canada, and next year the focus will be more broad, broad land Europe. So the, the initial market opportunity for us um, is around over $240 billion per annum, with Australia being really, you know, two or three percent of that, of that opportunity. So ours is a global business, and that's our focus. If I just now then want to move now towards home care, as you can see at the top of this chart here, our aged care market is around globally around 300 million. But our home care market, this is where more and more people uh, will do want to stay at home and where the majority of people to venture live, is we see that as being 10 times the opportunity. So we've started to enter into the home care markets and I'll have a quick summary on that. So, so again, you know, we're in, we've started in Australia with three pilot programs um, with, with home care providers. We have an agreement with Allied Care to start with home care in Canada. And we, we will schedule to enter both in, into UK and Europe in 2021 post the Australian initial results. The other thing I'd just like to mention here is we did, we've also now, it's not quite home care, but we now have a disability agreement with the Nelson groups for people living with disabilities. They've identified the similar need of the inability for, for people with disabilities to communicate effectively. So we've actually got our first um, contract agreement there. And we'll be seeing how that evolves um, in that sector. So, so home care market becomes a really important focus for us in 2022. Next is hospitals and a quick sum on the hospital progress. So, so again, we're focused on mission in Australia where we now have a research agreement with Ramsey Hospital Research and Cal University. And that's to assess patients in hospital uh, with frail patients in, in those conditions. The second area is with Philips. We continue to talk positively with Philips Healthcare for global opportunities. So once we have the Ramsey pro pro project going and, and continue with Philips, then we'll be looking for other European opportunities next year. So that's some of the adult products. The, on, the, on the kids' side, um, after this year, during the, during the pandemic, we were, were not able to actually progress the clinical trial in Melbourne, in Melbourne kids, but we have done our own internal study work, clinical studies, and this is again looking at the first product, which is the infant app for kids between zero to one year of age. That's progressing very positively. We've had some really good results with that on the clinical study. And our goal is to get that study completed end of this year and get that, get that in time for, for CMARC and TGA clearance for Q1 next year. This is, a, with, this is a very significant market as before. There's 400 million kids between the age of zero to three. And we see two, two opportunities here, really. Firstly, in hospital, um, post-procedural post pain uh, to keep assessing kids after, after, after painful procedures. And secondly, uh, the bigger market opportunity is in the home, and that is with obviously mums and dads who, who, have, who, who, want to look up to, who want to assess pain for their kids and differentiate whether the kids are crying because they're in discomfort or hunger or actually in pain. So we remain on schedule for the kids app for CMARC and TJ clearance in early 2021. This is a summary of all the product launches. Um, and I've covered these through the talk already, but, but as, as this, this hasn't changed from our previous one. We've already launched the enterprise. We're now in the market on home care and we remain on target for the pre-verbal kids product in Europe and Australia. And obviously the US follows about a year later. So highlights, key highlights. Um, so it's, it is, a, it is an enterprise business. We've got large, multiple global markets. We have a, deli a digital delivery method, which is proven to be very, very cost effective. Um, and we've got good support on the local and international markets. Um, we've had minimal churn in terms of, 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 of um, clients with less, less than 1% to date. Uh, and we, we really see that the pain check software is becoming embedded and a standard care in aged care. 
The team remains small. We have 17 staff in entirety, including the UK, and we, we, we really manage our operating costs very carefully um, and, and can do so even better now with our new business model. And the cost to adopt remains low, um, but the retention remains high. These were the catalysts we talked about previously, and we've actually announced the home care um, dementia pilots in Australia. We've announced the Canadian regulatory clearance. Um, and as I said before, we're on target for the kids pre-verbal product in, in Q1 2021. So we remain on, on track and we continue to actually communicate very well to the market. The team is a great team. Um, it's a very stable team now. Um, we've got We've got Jeff Hughes, who was our original innovator from, from Kirch University, and we brought in experienced aged care professionals and healthcare professionals in Australia and in the UK to manage our business there. And we've got a strong technology team led by Scott Robertson. The board is an experienced board. Uh, John Murray's um, actually on, on a number of boards in Australia, including another AI company, Seeing Machines. Ross Harris comes from the nucleus and cochlear. Um, backgrounds and Adam Davy has extensive capital markets experience. My background, again, for those who weren't aware, I've, I've worked for Cochlear for many years um, in Europe and in Australia, and also for Roche in Europe, US, and Australia. So, finally, in terms of capital, yes, we raised some capital last year. We raised $10 million sorry, earlier this year. Um, we, we maintain, we, we have a number of institutional investors now, as well as our, our cornerstone investors. Uh, including the Peterson investments, and our board and staff retain around 11% of the, of the, of the equity. Um, we have 30 million in cash, and that's really there to be used going forward for international markets and international market penetration. So on that point, I will just hold and pause for any questions. All right, thanks, Philip. Uh, first question is, what's the status of FDA submission and approval timeframe? What, if any, could be re the reasons for re rejection? Uh, right, so what we've done, we've submitted, we've, we've, we put in more than 120 days ago a pre-supplement, -sub which is basically saying, this is the study we're going to conduct in the US. And if we conduct this study and if we get it and it all goes to plan, will we get FDA clearance? Now, that's that is that was submitted about 120 days ago, a bit more actually. We are we've been waiting for the last I would say four to six weeks to get that final response from the FDA. Um, and once they, they do come back to us, then we're ready. We've already set up our clinical study protocols and programs to get the work done. The the work the research research work itself shouldn't take that long, say three to six months. But what we're doing is trying to be doing this the right way, making sure that what we do will actually achieve what the FDA expects. It's taken longer, and I believe that's the two reasons, you know, well, sorry, the big reason is with COVID in, in the US and that such a, and the FDA has been absolutely flat out trying to address those, um, trying to address how to get a vaccine out to the marketplace and address the address those issues there. So we've been impacted by COVID in terms of getting the feedback from the FDA, but in the meantime, we've got everything in place ready to go once we get that feedback. Great, thanks. Uh, and next question is, does this have an application for palliative care patients? Absolutely, 100%. In fact, we, we are starting in palliative care right now. In fact, Jennifer Abbey, who was the original uh, developer at Pain Scale, most of her work was done in palliative care. So yes, um, we've got a number of inquiries now for palliative care. And of course, that's often an extension of some of the aged care facilities as well. So yes, 100%, um, that's something I should have actually mentioned. So yes, it's not just home care, hospitals and disabilities, but also palliative care. Right. What can you tell us about the development of the AI used, e.g. data used for training and validating the models? And does the pain assessment get better or more accurate the more you use it? Good question. Um, and there's a couple of few times you've really got, with AI, you've got two methods. You've got the, AI, you've got the static and the dynamic. Static is when you train it at the front end using models. And that's what we did. We trained it. In, we trained our AI with with a with a whole sequence of videos and 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 yeah, videos of people actually going through painful procedures and then coding coding with those videos. Um, that's how we, we trained it in the first instance. Um, but what we what we are is we are static. Is we tr we trained it. We implement it into the product and we use it now. 
when we do an assessment, we don't actually store those pictures. We don't assess those pictures because one is privacy reason, another one is storage of data. So we just assess the face, we pick up which of the nine microfacial features are pain and present based upon the trained model. And then we, we then just communicate those results to the actual carer. Um, and one of the reasons, so we, so we don't learn every time, we don't utilize that data every time for our model. And one of those reasons is that, or the main reason is because being a medical device, you, if you, were, if you, you can't keep changing your product. You have to, to build the product, you have to validate it, you have to go to the clinical trials, you have to show that it works, and then you can use it. So, you, so if, you do, if you did take a dynamic approach, in other words, every time you use it, you try to learn, you'd have to, to keep going back to regulators and explain the change you've done and, and revalidate the whole process. So being a medical device really pushes you to be more of the, the static upfront trained model rather than the back end dynamic model. But you know, I would add the FDA are also looking into this as all the regulators are because sometime down the future, I think that will shift, um, but, but it's not there yet. Great. Next question is, is there other potential areas of research or applications of the technology PainCheck is looking into like concussion testing, et cetera? Yeah, look, we, we, one of the things we, we, do, we do see that this has got broader application in terms of, you know, um, broader in terms of, you know, people being able to, I mean, one of the questions we get constantly get asked is that can, you know, can you recognize if people are actually truly in pain or not, if they're faking it or not faking it? And these are all questions that, that come up on a regular basis. Um, at the moment, um, those are potential areas, but that, that's, they're quite complex as well. But the moment where I would say is that, you know, our, our markets are so large, you know, pain assessments, just as, and for people dementia, for kids, is, is a significant, are significantly large global markets. Each of those I've covered today were, if you had them all together, that's about two and a half billion dollar per annum market. That's our opportunity. So, you know, our strategy is, Let's become the gold standard, which we're becoming in Australia, and let's take that and expand it around the world because Australia is effectively 2% of our global opportunity and aged care is the smallest opportunity within compared to hospitals and home care. So our focus is let's become the gold standard, which we, we believe already are in pain assessment, and let's take that out globally. Now, and I've done that with Cochlear, I've done that with Roche, and we've got the, the right team, the right support and the right board to make that happen. Do you think there's potential for similar government support in other international markets? Well, yes, I do. And in fact, you know, one thing I just didn't really explain explicitly was that if you look at what we're doing with the government here, we're doing a, we're doing in parallel to the, to the rollout of the pain check app into aged care and the contract being signed. We're also doing a study with KPMG, which is funded by this government grant. And that, that independent study is, is part of it's just going back to the federal government as part, part of their policy making for the future. So, so we, see, we see potential for long-term government funding here. Obviously, we do we need to, you know, we've got great relationship with Department of Health and great relationship with the federal government, which is critical, um, and, and all the regulators around. But yes, UK and other markets, you know, it's a natural, it's a natural evolution that if once a product is seen as highly valuable in a healthcare center spot then, you know, um, government support, whether it be reimbursements or co-funding or a Medicare um, number, those are things that can, can come down the line. And it's things we're working on, absolutely. Right, and is there any plan on extending to other pain scales, i.e. WOMAC? Again, a very good question. I, what I would say at this stage is we are, we want to make pain check Currently, pain check is now the gold standard for people who cannot verbalize their pain. Um, our goal is to make pain check the universal pain assessment tool. And therefore, we are working on projects that will make this, you know, broaden the application for it, you know, outside of our current area. Our current area is big, um, but we're looking at other ways. So, uh, you know, it, we're not limited to one area. We, our focus is, is, is to become the gold standard and make pain a new vital sign. You know, blood pressure, pulse, temperature, these are all vital signs. We want pain to be a measurable vital sign. And that's our goal. And it's and I think it will be as big as all those other four or four or five key vital signs. Right. And can you talk about pain checks path to standard care practice? What what needs to happen for that to happen? What do you mean standard care practice? I think uh, in terms of a broader approach. 
Yeah, exactly what I just said. I mean, you know, pain, pain, pain has to be assessed. You know, as I said right at the beginning, pain is difficult to assess, even for people who can verbalize. It's a case, you know, doctors and nurses are always trying to work out, you know, it, when somebody says they're a six or a seven, is that really true? Um, so for those who can't, can verbalize, it's still, you know, subjective because you're relying on somebody's giving you the result, their results. For those who can't verbalize, then pain check is a tool right there. So our goal is to make main pain check a tool that can be used for all people. Um, and, and that's part of our strategy. Right, thanks, Philip. That uh, concludes the questions. I might just hand back to you uh, to, to wrap up and we'll, we'll finish up there. Thanks very much. Well, just from, from my standpoint, to say thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to all the shareholders and supporters for, for your support for the past period. Um, you know, if there's one message I would get out to everybody, and that is, you know, we have, we've established ourselves in aged care. We are the most commonly used tool, clinical tool, should I say, software tool in aged care now. Uh, we've got great take up and great great retention of our existing clients. Our goal is to take that beginnings and take that broader into home care, into hospitals, into disabilities, and do that on a global scale. So, so my focus for the next 12 months is we've established Australia, and our focus as a company now is the international markets and the broadening of the applications. Great. Thanks so much, Philip. Thanks all for joining. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.